pushing back now. Hey everyone, and welcome to another installment of our Thermopen One Live Cooking Classes. My name is Tim Robinson. I'm Vice President of Marketing here at Thermoworks, and it is a, a pleasure for me to join you every Thursday evening. Uh, if it's Thursday evening, it's a Thermopen One Live Cooking Class. And uh, we're super excited tonight to have uh, a bona fide YouTube star, Ethan Slabowski, as our, our guest host. Can't wait to get to, to what he's got prepared for you. Uh, by way of introduction, if you've been following along, you know that we created this series of cooking classes to celebrate the launch of the Thermopen One into the world. And what we really wanted to do was to uh, celebrate the way that all of the advances in engineering on the Thermopen One empower you to seek perfection in your own craft. And we wanted to show both the versatility of the Thermopen as well as the impact of its precision on actual cooking experience. And so I'm super excited to be moving from the grill and where we've been doing searing of steaks and other types of proteins into frying tonight. So we're going to be doing beer battered fish and chips, Ethan's famous recipe. Uh, and so we're going to get to see the Thermopen one uh, walk through its paces in a frying exercise. I did want to give you a little bit more detail about the Thermopen One um, in terms of the marvel of engineering that it is. The Thermopen One, as you know, is accurate to plus or minus 0.5 degrees, which is an unprecedented accuracy. Uh, that's Fahrenheit, of course. Um, and it also has sub second performance, right? So you can see that as I put that in there, that's less than a second for it to get to 32 degrees. Um, what most people don't know is that a thermocouple, as is in the very, very tip of this Thermopen one, actually takes what are called time constants, five time constants to get a full reading. So as the Thermopen uh, sensor at the very, very tip of the Thermopen one goes from room temperature around 70 degrees here to the 32 degrees inside this ice bath, the first time constant that it takes, oh, I need to lift this up, I'm being told. The first time constant takes it 63.2% of the way to the temperature that it's measuring. And it actually goes through five time constants to get all the way to 99.3 or virtually 100% uh, of the, the temperature being measured. Those time constants take time. And so a sub second uh, reading on a Thermopen one is not just one reading in less than a second, it's actually five different time constants that add up to that 99.3 or virtually 100% reading of whatever it is you're measuring. So think about that. The, the sensor that is affixed right here in the very tip of the Thermopen one goes into the food that you're cooking, which of course is at a dynamic temperature, it's changing its temperature, and it takes a quick reading and it does that five times each time constant lasting between 0.1 and 0.2 seconds in order to give you that sub-second performance. It's truly mind-boggling to think about, and that's what the engineers were able to do. But again, it only matters in as much as it allows you to make split-second decisions about the, the cooking that you're doing, the, the frying that you're doing tonight that Ethan will be doing. Ethan Schlebowski, if you know Ethan, if you're a fan of Ethan and you're here, welcome. Uh, we are Thermoworks, we're thrilled to have you here. Uh, if you're new to Ethan, you are in for a treat. Ethan is uh, an everyday Joe, just like you or me, uh, who decided to throw himself into cooking. He doesn't have any uh, expertise or special training, but what he does have is a, a keen mind, an attention to detail, and he's very, very precise in the things that he does and the measurements that he takes. And he, he throws himself with passion and enthusiasm into the whole science of cooking, understanding the principles that are at work and how those affect the food that we eat. Um, it was kind of a perfect and natural pairing for Thermoworks to want to work with Ethan because of that commitment to his craft and that passion that he brings to the detail. Uh, and so, he is someone for whom a Thermopen one can really have an impact. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Ethan Slabowski and throw it over to Ethan over near Carlsbad, California for beer battered fish and chips. Take it away, Ethan.
All right, I think we're uh, I think we're live. I think we're unmuted. If everyone in the chat can let me know. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we're good to go here. But I think I think everyone should be able to hear me, should be able to see me, um, and we'll be ready to make some fish and chips, which is one of my favorites. And actually, I haven't made it this summer yet. So let me just let me just see if anyone can get one chat. I think we should be good though. But I don't want to start. I don't want to start right away. Start too early. All right, sweet. Everyone, we can hear. Sweet, perfect. All right. So yeah, fish and chips. You know, we're gonna. It's pretty simple, actually. This this actually is not gonna take all that long. Um, which for me, as someone who you know used to really not like frying as much, because um, I didn't really understand it. But now that I understand it, what's going on? help with, you know, thermopen and temperatures. It really makes it like this really approachable thing you can do at home. And it's a very delicious way to make some fried food. I mean, we all love fried food. So I have some rock bass right here. And this is actually fish that we caught on a charter um, probably like back in May. It was like the last pack I had in the freezer. And I was going to go get some at the store. And then I was like, no, I'll just use up the rest of this. So these are some rock bass fillets that um, I kind of cut in half. And I kind of try to get them in equal chunks. So this is what it looked like before. And then I just cut it right down the center. A little bit uneven, but I'm probably just going to work with these two larger pieces right here. And then I'll fry these afterwards as well. Um, but what I've done with these, I have actually salted them beforehand. So I salted them a couple hours ago just to let that salt work in there. Um, you know, brining, we've probably all heard of it, dry brining. The salt works its way inside through diffusion, internally seasoning it. So if you have the time, I would recommend it. Um, but all we have to do for this is make a batter. So we're going to do that first and then we'll dip it. We'll get our oil heated up. We'll get all this going. Um, and let me just wash my hands real quick. because I touch that fish? And then we'll be ready to fire this up. Actually, one, I'm actually going to make our sauce first. You got to have a, you got to have a good dipping sauce. So I'm going to get that done right now just because you have to have a good sauce it's it's a it's a requirement and this is just like kind of based off a of tartar sauce except it's not i don't have like everything a classic tartar sauce would have i think typically there's like capers chives shallots some i'm thinking i'm missing all those so what we're going to do is just like a basic mayo based thing um Kind of eyeballing it a little bit. I did write down, I think, some base, base ingredients here. But, um, you know, this is just like a basic mayo-based sauce, you know, with some vinegar, some, some acidity from the lime juice or lemon juice, actually. Let me just pull up this. And I love using, you know, scales like this where I don't really worry about, like, tablespoons or all that. Like, you don't have to deal with it. I just throw it on here. So I'm going to do like 100 grams of mayo. Like that. Wipe this off for the next jar. I'm going to do about 20 grams of this Dijon mustard. And then I can, uh, if you guys do want to make this afterwards, I'm sure we can post all these things in the, um, post all the amounts and, and things in the description if you guys want them afterwards. Uh, salt two hours ahead of time in the fridge or room temp. Um, so I pop this in the fridge and then I'm just pulling it out right now. It, it doesn't make a huge difference, um, actually, the temperatures, like if you pull it out way ahead of time or not. Um, you know, because even if it's in the fridge and you pull it out like, you know, several hours before, it, it doesn't actually raise the internal temperature all that much. And then the oil is going to do all the work in, in raising it. So there's not a huge deal. You can just pop it in the fridge and then pull it out when you're when you're getting ready. Um, other ingredients. I know I'm throwing in some cornichons. So I'm going to do like two of these, which are basically just kind of very sour and small pickles. I'm going to throw in a little bit of lemon as well, parsley. 
and then our black pepper and some salt. And just trying to get like a pretty small dice on these. Don't want overly large chunks in there. And as you guys get questions, don't don't uh, don't hesitate. Just pop them in chat. I'll get to them as I can. And I'm also going to throw a little bit of parsley in this too. Just trying to ball it up. Rough chop it. And then we'll dice it. Enough for me. A right, little bit of black pepper. This is probably about, should have counted, but about 20 cranks. My preferred term of measurement for pepper. And then I'm just gonna toss in a little bit of salt. We'll add just a tiny bit now and then I'll give it a taste and, and adjust from there. So a little tangy, fresh herbs, salt, pepper. Really nice to dip with some, some fried fish. Yeah, pretty good. I think I'm going to add a little bit more lemon juice just to thin it out. But other than that, I mean, very basic, very, very basic sauce. And obviously, I mean, if you want it thinner, you could add some more, you could add vinegar, you could add water. I kind of like it a little bit thicker. But yeah, that's, that's all I'm looking for. And then I'm just gonna pop this in the fridge. Um, get this done ahead of time. And then we are on to the fish. Uh, appreciate that Frappuccino. I uh, hope you have a good rest of your night. You tried the cacio e pepe recipe, but failed miserably. The cheese was way too watery. Ended up with plain spaghetti. Yeah, cacio e pepe is pretty tough. Um, typically, probably the biggest thing is heat control. So typically, it, that that probably was too much heat um, if it ended up watery. I mean, or it could have just been too much pasta water. But yeah, if it if the cheese doesn't really melt down and get creamy. Likely, it's due to too much heat. All right, so we got that out of the way. 
Now I'm going to get out just a little pan and I'm going to just throw some flour on this. So I'm going to, we'll flour up the, the fish pieces before we throw them in the batter just to help that batter stick a little bit better. So that's all this tray is going to be used for. And then speaking of for our batter, let me grab out my other bowl here. Clear one. Well, before I do the batter, let me just get the oil started because that's not going to take too long. Well, I can do the dry, I gotta do dry, dry ingredients. Um, <clears throat> you finish up watching this feedy episode, gonna be making it for the whole, ooh, yeah. That's uh, that chicken is really, really good. And again, just, Hit it with the marinade afterwards, I think is the way to go and just cook the tender until it's chicken or until cook the chicken until it's really tender. Um, yeah, that's one of my favorites. Um, can't really beat that. So for the beer batter, I, I'm going to use a mix of flour and cornstarch. And kind of the key with this batter is minimizing the, um, the gluten development. So this is 100 grams of flour. And the reason why we want to minimize gluten development is we want it to be really light. We don't want it to be like a dough. So doughs, like pizza doughs, you want the gluten developed so you can really stretch it out. But that's not really what we're looking for in this case. We're looking closer to like somewhere in between like a crepe batter and a, and a pancake batter. Um, and it's, and it's going to be much lighter and fluffier if we don't develop the gluten too much. And there's a couple ways you do that. One, you don't want to over mix it. Then two, um, you can use carbonated water or beer like we're going to do today. Um, you can also use hard alcohols um, because they, um, they uh, dehydrate faster than the, uh, if you were to use all water. So that's another way to do it. Um, and then that was about 25 grams of cornstarch. Toss back this in here, just getting everything out of the way as I need it. And then I'm just gonna add a couple spices as well. Sorry, corn baking powder too. Five grams of baking powder. Again, I'm going to toss this back in my pantry spot. I'm going to do five grams of salt just to season it. And then, yeah, now we're going to just come in. You could come in with anything you wanted here. I'm just going to do some, uh, some garlic powder. That's really, I just wanted a little bit to kind of break up and break in, which I see my garlic powder has gotten a little bit of water in it, apparently kind of clumped up on me. Just gonna break it up. And then some black pepper. Which I also need to refill. Um, I heard a lot of thoughts on chopping herbs. Some say only cut with knife moving or sliding. Others did as you did, straight down cuts. Yeah, so with herbs, you're kind of tricky. Um, it it kind of depends a lot on what you're going for. Because basically with herbs, they, they hold their essential oils in, in glands of some sort on, you know, on the exterior of the leaves. So you're trying to release that, that oil. Um, you know, it's kind of like using the mortar and pestle 
for like basil versus slicing it. If you use the mortar and pestle, you grind everything up and all that, all those things pop and it releases it. Whereas slicing it, you end up with like little shards of leaves, which actually doesn't release as many. So it kind of depends as far as cutting to cutting. Um, I think you just got to cut them up enough and it's going to release enough. Um, I haven't done like very specific testing, like only doing a specific kind of cut versus another cut. Um, I'm actually going to add some cayenne pepper to this too. Make it a little bit spicy. That's my smoked paprika. Yeah. Also give it a nice little reddish color. And then here I'm just like loosening up the clumps a little bit. We got the tiny whisk from Babish. If you guys have seen him, you know. Um, all right, now before I pop in the, the beer into that, I'm actually gonna get the oil started. So I'm just using this little gas burner just cause it's, it's pretty convenient to, uh, to pop out here. And then I have peanut oil. So for me, peanut oil, it, it's a little bit higher in saturated fat with helps with some of the, the browning um, compared to lower saturated um, fat percentage oils like uh, you know olive oil or just plain vegetable oil. So this is kind of my preferred. And basically I'm using a wok too because the high edges actually are really nice because you don't have to fill this up, you know, all the way here and in, in general, in frying, you don't want to do that. You kind of just want to leave enough to fry the food you were frying, but no more than that. You know, I don't want to this way up here or else it, it'd be bubbling everywhere. Um, so I've probably got about, I don't know, maybe an inch and a half, maybe two inches up the side of that. And this is just some leftover fry oil. Um, that I strained out last time I used it. And I'm going to do the same time with this. And then I'm just going to pop this burner on. I'll just put it on low, let it come to heat. And what I'm looking for in this is to bring it to right around 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that is a really good temperature for pretty much anything you're frying. Um, and knowing these temperatures when frying is really helpful because if it's too hot, that's when, say if it's like 400, 450 or, or something like that, and you, you aren't monitoring it with a, you know, a thermometer, that's when like those big, huge flare up happens. That's like everyone's nightmare. But if you're just checking it with, you know, a thermometer, it's 350 or like, you know, 325 to like 375 is kind of that zone where nothing's going to go wrong. Like it, it's, it's been done millions of times before. Like it'll be be done millions of times again. It's nothing to be afraid of. You just gotta, you know, use your equipment correctly. I used to be one of those people that like was like, oh man, deep frying such a hassle. It's so annoying. The oil gets everywhere. Yada yada yada. But like if you're using, you know, a, a wide bodied pot or a wok, it's not gonna splatter everywhere. You know the temperature it's gonna be. You'll be all right. Like it's it's actually pretty easy to do at home. And and it's something that I do on my channel all the time. I've done fried chicken sandwiches. We've done French fries. We've done so much stuff, countless, countless times. All right. And now we're just going to make our batter. And I need a beer for the batter. So the beer is kind of interesting. It does a couple things. Like I mentioned, carbonation. So it's going to help keep everything nice and light and fluffy um, in there. And then it also has, typically it has some sugars in there, which is going to help give us a little bit of a browner crust, um, which is really nice. And I'm just going to add probably about half of this. Um, we'll see. I don't want it overly thin. I don't want it overly thick. So I'm just going to start with like 200 grams. And yes, I weigh out my, uh, my, my liquids like that. I know it, I know it upsets some people who, who say it should be milliliters, but in general, one gram of water is one milliliter of water. All right. So we're going to start with 200 grams. I'm going to lightly mix this. And again, I don't want to overmix this. 
I just want to bring everything together slowly. Um, and uh, actually, one more thing. I'm going to add a little bit of vinegar as well, just for a little bit of acidity. And this is just this is just 10 grams of white vinegar. Don't have to do that if you don't want to. And I can already feel this is not enough. It's, it's a little thicker. So I'm going to add another 50 grams. So we got 250 grams in there for about 125 grams of dry ingredients. So about two parts to one part there. And you can see how like super carbonated, light and fluffy it is. And it is okay if there are lumps. But I just wanna get it thinned out evenly. I can catch up on a couple questions though. Uh, could you use all corn starch as a gluten-free option or would that not work as well without the flour? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I've i never tested it with all corn starch, um, but I have done, I have fried food with just all corn starch as the outer coating. Um, I don't know how well this mixture would stay together with only corn starch, um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure actually. That's a good question. You could definitely raise the amount of cornstarch if you wanted to. Uh, how do you strain your oil? Uh, cheesecloth coffee filter. So what I do is, I'll show you right now. Um, I actually just use one of these. So a metal strainer. Um, I actually have a finer one than this that I'll typically use. If, if, it was, if I use the oil for like French fries or something and that's it, um, and like pieces of it pieces of like flour from like fried chicken or batter didn't fall into it. I'll just use my finer mesh strainer, which I think is in the, the dishwasher because I strained off the oil yesterday um, and just pour that through. If there are like some flour bits in there, I'll throw a paper towel right in the center of this and then just let it drip through. So just let the oil cool down after you're done using it and then you'll be, uh, you'll be good to go. But that's the general process I follow. Okay, I think we got everything. <clears throat> Let me just double check here, make sure I'm not missing anything. It's always funny, like on lives, I, I always have to like remind myself to make sure I, make sure I do everything. I've, lots of times I just like miss stuff and I'm like, well, didn't make a big difference, but it's okay. Okay, yeah, so we're just waiting on this to, to rise up. And then I, I should have mentioned too, I do have, we are doing chips, you probably realized. So these are um, chips, French fries that I made yesterday, started yesterday, I should say. So these were boiled in water with some vinegar and salt. So the salt seasons them, the, the vinegar kind of helps them keep their structure a little bit so they're not falling apart. And then that process also bursts the starch granules on the outside. Um, which helps them crisp up. Then after that, after I boiled them, I just drained them off and then threw them into um, 375 degree oil for a single fry. The first fry, it's like a par fry. And that also starts to create the, um, the little starch bubbles on the outside. And if I come up close, hopefully you guys can see this. And then I just froze them after that. So let me see. Well, it, I don't know if you guys can see it. You might be able to, you might not, but there are like little bumps and bubbles in here from that frying process. And then that's the great thing about these is you can just pop them in the freezer. And then instead of having to go through that entire process, you know, all at once, you just pull out however many you want and then you just fry them. We'll do it after our, um, after we fry our fish, which is really convenient. So I'm going to pull these back out after we do the fish, after we do the fish, and then uh, we'll fry those for probably about three and a half to four minutes. So let me check this temperature, see where we're at. Again, I'm shooting for like 350. And you guys, I don't know if you can see this, but only at like 190 right now. So we'll bump this up. I had it on pretty low just so it didn't go way above without me uh, realizing it. And then if your oil does get too hot, which can happen, like if I had noticed that was at like 400, 
Um, I'd probably want that to come down a little bit. So what I could do is just obviously take it off the heat, but it does take a little while to come down. Or I could throw in some more oil to help kind of counteract that a little bit. <clears throat> and basically what, what we're going to do once this oil is ready is dip the fish in our flour to coat it. Then we're going to pop it right in here. And as soon as it's done in there, I want to pop it right into the hot oil, kind of minimize that time. So make sure there's, you know, plenty of that coating stuck on onto the fish, but I don't want like all of it to drip off in the meantime, you know. And I'm actually going to add, I think I'm going to add a little more flour now. I feel like this has gotten a little bit, it's kind of like right on the edge of where I want it, I feel like. So we're going to add a little bit more flour. keep it out in case I, in case I decide to, uh, to add more. Yeah. So I would say this is probably like around a, a thin pancake batter, not like a, a huge thick pancake batter, but like a thinner one. And it's got a ton of bubbles in it too, from the, from the carbonation, from the beer. And then obviously we'll get that flavor from the beer as well, which is really nice. All right, so we're raising up pretty fast here. 287. So probably just another minute or two. And again, we're shooting for that 350. Is this a camping gas uh, burner? Um, yeah, yeah, it is. It's just a basic, a basic like portable gas stove. Um, I don't know what the BTUs are on this. I don't want to move it too much while the oil is, uh, you know, while the hot oil is going on. But yeah, this is literally just a basic... It says it down there, but I'll try to get that for you afterwards. But yeah, it's a really basic, um, just camp stove, essentially. Do you re reuse oil from Brian? Yeah, we do. We do um, moods. I was touching on that earlier. Um, yeah, so I also should point this out too. So when you are reusing oil, it, it does depend on what you are using it for, um, how many times you can reuse it. So I think America's Test Kitchen did a test on this um, where they took oils that were reused for things like French fries, which is, you know, typically just throwing in French fries. There's not flour, there's not batters, there's not um, whatever. And they noticed that they could use that up to at least eight times um, before it actually started to degrade. And then for things like fried chicken, beer battered fish like this, fried fish, or things with breadings and, and things of that nature, they noticed you could reuse it about three to four times. And for me, the big thing is when I am reusing it um, is you don't want to burn, let anything burn in there because that burnt flavor, you know, if it will stay in there. So that's kind of the big thing is making sure we're not like leaving burnt bits in there. So we're at 330. Perfect. Um, let that come to temp just a tiny bit more. And then, uh, and then we'll fry our fish. Oh, yeah. And to finish our frying station, this is another really big thing for frying. Um, make sure you have like your station ready to go. Make sure you have it prepared. Um, so you can see right here kind of the order of operations, I guess, I guess we should put it. Um, fish, flour, batter, it's going to be fried. And then I have a wire rack over a baking sheet right here. And then that's where I'm going to place that um, after it's done frying. So big kind of pro tip is just like make sure you have everything in order and you're not like you know creating this mass chaos in your kitchen while you have really hot oil on the counter as well 
What type of beer is that? Uh, this is just a blonde ale. So in general, I think lighter beers work well for this. Um, so it could just be, you know, a regular, like, uh, you know, a, a Coors or a Bud Light or, or PBR, like a, a super light beer if you wanted to. Um, I just happen to have this blonde ale, so that's what I'm using. Um, I have done IPAs. I wouldn't suggest heavy dark beers, like maybe I would not really suggest price stouts or, or things of that nature. Though, I mean, at the end of the day, you probably could use just about any beer, but yeah, I, I think lighter beers are, are definitely, the, uh, definitely the way to go. All right, this should definitely be about here. And then one other thing, I guess, um, for the, we're gonna, we are gonna check the temp of the fish, um, which I wanted to get at least 140. Um, it'll probably, ideally these probably finish right about the same time. Like it's golden brown and crispy and the fish is at least 140. Um, so that's kind of another thing that you can check as well. But this is right at like 335. So just monitoring that. And then I'm going to start with these. Uh, David, we're making um, uh, beer battered fish and, uh, and, and chips. So you're literally in the, uh, in the action. Like this is the, the most exciting part. And this is probably only going to take, I don't know, it's not going to take too long, maybe six to eight minutes. I mean, we'll see. You guys can, you guys can tell on the live how, how much time it actually takes. But I'm going to pop the flour on this. And again, this is just to help that batter give it something to stick to. So I'm going to get these nice and flattered. And I'll just do these two fillets. I'll save the other ones for later. The one hand. Perfect. Hovering right around 353. So that signifies to me we are ready to go. I'm going to turn that down just a tiny bit. Fish right into the batter. And again, there are some lumps in this. Perfectly fine. Not going to be a big deal. A little bit of this and then right in to our oil and just slowly release it, releasing it away from me. And then we'll do this other piece and see like nothing, nothing crazy is happening. It's not boiling or it's, you know, it's not dripping out over the top. Like we have the temperature, we know it's not going to go crazy. And you can really smell the beer in this batter. It's so good. Perfect. And now we just sit back and let this fry for a couple minutes. Um, I am going to agitate the oil just to make sure we are kind of flowing out and flowing over it. Um, but yeah, this is going to be super light and crispy, making sure these don't run into each other. And They're nice and puffy. And then I'll give you guys some close-ups um, after I pull these out. But again, just keeping things moving a little bit. And also if you want to, some people will like to, uh, you know, do some like little drizzles. You can like drizzle some of this extra batter on top of the, on top of the fish, create like some weird, you know, little, little like, you know, things that collect on the fish. And it's just kind of a fun little thing to do if you want to. And one thing that does happen, you do need to monitor your temperature while you're going. So it's going to, it's going to drop quite a bit um, as we drop in, you know, all this food. So we're dropping down to like low 300s. As long as you stay like above 300, you're usually, you're usually going to be okay. Um, but yeah, you just got to keep an eye on that and, and, you might need to fiddle with your burner a little bit or whatever it is. 
you know, the more food that you are frying, the more it's going to affect the temperature of the oil. Won't the fish fall to the, the bottom of the frying pan? Um, no, it actually, it actually will, it should float and stay submerged. And especially that's like a, one of the, the benchmarks for when fried food is done is when it does start to float. Um, but yeah, it won't plummet right to the bottom. It'll kind of stay, it'll stay up if there's enough, you know, surface area to keep it up. And then I'm just gonna toss these over here. Again, I'll probably I'll batter those other two pieces and make these later probably. But we'll just we'll just stick with our our main two pieces for the uh, the purposes of the live. And I'll I'll actually swing this over as well. And obviously, you know, normally you wouldn't have a moving burner, so I really wouldn't suggest moving hot oil around. But just so you guys can see a little bit better. So I'm trying to flip these a little bit just because the oil is um, not quite as high, but like you guys can see, starting to brown up really nicely. Crispy, it's set on the exterior. And again, I drizzled some over the top. So now it's just basically a waiting game. Um, once these are looking kind of browned all over, then I'll take the temperature of the in inside um, just to make sure it's at least 140, but typically the, uh, typically the inside's done by the time these are nice and brown on the outside. And then we'll do our French fries, which take just a couple minutes as well. Uh, what would be the perfect cooking temp of the oil if in a perk word you can control to your degree and notice you turn it down? Ooh, the, yeah, the like absolute perfect. Um, I don't know if there is like an absolute perfect temperature, but I guess, I guess the temperature where the, uh, at certain temperatures, oil does start to break down. So any, it's got to be below that. And then it also does depend on the type of food. So I don't know if there's like a one specific perfect, perfect oil temp. But you can see like we are splattering some oil, but it's mainly coming straight up. It's not really getting everywhere. Like uh, some is popping outside, like onto the table, but not, not much. And that's why I really like using woks. And yeah, we're getting pretty close to being done here. I'm going to turn this down just a tiny bit. Just because I noticed it bubbling a little bit. So now I'm going to check the internal temp of this. I'm going to move it over here. Yeah, so we're sitting, if you guys can see this, 143, 142. So that's like right around what I was saying. So basically how I did to check that was I went through and then I pulled back to the center until it starts dropping. And then that's how I know that I've got, um, you know, that center area, making sure it's, it's cooked all the way through to the center. So like as you pull back, you should notice that the temperature drops on your thermometer. So we're good to go with that one. This, that one I think was thicker than this one. So we're good there. And then beautifully crisp. I'm gonna turn this down and then we'll do our, our, uh, our chips. So I'm just gonna bring this back up 
we're right back at around 350 again. 355. Good enough. And I'm going to fish out these uh, these little batter pieces that were left behind. Um, again, because I don't want them to like burn and overcook. That's again another kind of tip for being able to reuse that oil. So just trying to get the big pieces out of here. And then now we finish our fries and then we'll be done. I do like three or four minutes on these. We just double check oil should be, I mean, I literally just checked a second ago. Yeah, 340, good enough, close to that area. So I'm just gonna pull some of these out. And again, if anyone's new, these I were boiled, fried and frozen. I'm just gonna slowly drop them in. And then this, I am gonna need to turn up the heat a good bit probably just because these are cold, very cold, or they're, you know, they're frozen. So they're probably gonna drop the, uh, the temperature of the oil a good bit more. So you gotta be a little cognizant about what what and how much of the food you're adding to kind of adjust temperature as you are going of your burner. And just cause I'm curious, this probably like plummeted way down. Yeah, see, this is like all the way down to 260. And again, high volume of food, also cold food, very, you know, frozen food. So we're just going to bring this back up to temp and let these fry for probably about three to four minutes. Again, these, I mean, th these are not really worried about them cooking to a certain doneness um, on the inside, obviously. You just want them to be golden brown and crispy on the outside. And then these will stay nice and crispy during that time. So no worries there. Uh, video topic idea, all your different cast iron pan wants or for what, that is a good idea. Yeah, to kind of which pans I use in which situations. Cause yeah, there's definitely a couple that I really just go to over and over. Um, and for me, the walk has been one of the biggest kind of ones that's changed over time. You know, it used to be like, you know, when I first got into cooking, a walk was like, oh, I can only make fried rice or I can only make stir fries in that. Um, but now, like, I make a lot of stuff in my walk. I do fry. It's the, pretty much the only thing I fry food in anymore. Um, I also do, um, I'll do Italian pastas in this. Um, I actually really like it for finishing things like, um, cacio e pepe or alio e olio and, and those kind of pastas too. They're actually really nice because you can control the heat. You can turn it all, all the way off and then toss everything together really nicely. <clears throat> well, am I off here? I might be I'm burning off. I think it is. All right, we're going to reboot this guy. I may have adjusted it too much while we were going down there. <clears throat> um, the last chicken skewer recipe was bomb. Yeah, I love that. The oil temp was referring to this dish, which we tried to maintain the temp. Yeah, so you just you want to maintain it around that 350 degrees Fahrenheit if you can. Um, that's just going to be that's going to be a solid temperature where you're not overcooking. You're not cooking the outside too fast. Um, whereas the inside won't get cooked. So like this, like it got brown as the internal temp hit, you know, 140 or whatever. So like, that's kind of, that's kind of what you're balancing when frying, you know, you could fry at 400 or 450. Um, but likely that's when big flare ups happen, um, from the, from the oil and the water that's steaming off. And also you're going to crisp the outside far before the interior um, of whatever you're cooking is done. If you are doing something like fish or chicken. And so these aren't, so not having the burner on obviously didn't help us, but we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna conquer 
through this and get these things crispy. Uh, can you reuse that oil for all cooking purpose, like oil in a pan or just frying? Um, yeah, you could, you could. It'll, it'll definitely have like an oil taste to it. Um, like it, it, it'll have a taste that you, you know, it was fried in. I, I should put it that way. Like if, if I put, um, so I use peanut oil. It's one of my oils that I always have out. But if I put this oil and then strained it back into here, like I could tell that there, it, it has been fried with. But if it's for something like ch uh, chips or you know French fries or or whatever, it's not going to be that overpowering. Whereas something if it was like fried chicken or fish, you may notice it a bit more. But yeah, you definitely could if you wanted to. Um, can you go to a higher oil temp prior to putting in that frozen food to compensate for dropping back? Yeah, you definitely could. Um, so the thing with the thing with oil, you're 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 trying to balance, I guess, the amount of oil you have, the volume of food, and the temperature of food only if it's frozen, like like you kind of mentioned there. Um, yeah, you just got to be kind of wary of you know if you blast it all the way up to 450. Sometimes it may not drop, you know, perfectly down to like 375. Sometimes it may stay higher than that. So you just have to be a little, a little bit careful. I wouldn't really suggest going over like 375 or 400 at probably the highest, um, even if you are doing frozen food. Um, just because when, when the oil gets super hot, um, it can, you know, it, that water, which is what's actually steaming off when we fry things, can, can kind, of, kind of go a little bit crazy if it is really hot oil. So yeah, so the way that I would probably compensate for frozen food is maybe maybe go like 25 degrees higher than you're trying to, um, or just add more oil, you know, the more, you know, the more volume of oil, the less of the effect it's gonna have. And then we'll get our plate ready as well. Oh, I can't wait to dive into this stuff. Beautiful. What is the framed picture behind you? You need to know. Um, oh, that one. That's a. Uh, that's actually a creation of my own. Um, it's the Brussels sprout salad equation from one of my videos. I actually have it on my website. Um, you can you can purchase the print or the uh, like the digital file and print it out if you would like. But yeah, it's a it's a fun little useful piece of uh, art, I guess you'd say, functional art. I'll just sit this here. It's fine. Uh, last question about reusing oil. One, once it is used the first time for frying, how long is it safe to keep for reusing in time? Um, yeah. So did it, I mentioned the uh, I mentioned the America's Test Kitchen article. So they mentioned you can reuse it. You know, if it's just for things like French fries on only, you can use it up to eight times and really not have any problems. Three to four for things like you know fish or chicken. And then obviously just use your senses too. Like if the oil smells bad, um, like maybe, maybe you only used it once, but then you let it sit in your cabinet for six months and it smells bad, probably don't use that oil again. Um, but yeah, there's a great, uh, America's test kitchen article. Um, you should be, it should pop right up. And then they, these are getting here slowly. We had our little snafu with the, uh, with the burner that I accidentally turned off, but we're getting here, folks. And just if you guys want to temp check on this oil. I think we should be. Yeah, so we've dropped again due to me not uh not having a burner on. But it's not gonna 
overly affect thing. I think the mistake is you'd probably have the oil be a tiny bit lower um, than too high and having things, you know, burn and crisp too quickly. You can always raise the temp. And actually, I think it's a common myth where people think that like the longer you or the lower temperature, the more oil is absorbed, but they've actually done a lot of uh, a test on that. And that's actually not the case, but these are getting close. I can feel them getting crispy on my, uh, on my spoon here. Oh, moods and not in uses. Okay. I, so I think I answered your question. Yeah. So I don't know the, like, you know, one month, two month, I would, I would definitely go by smell. Um, you know, if it smells bad, use your senses, use your, your best judgment. What's your favorite food in the world? You're charging Monday night specials at your workplace and need some ideas. Oh, that is like literally the hardest question that people ask me. Cause I like a lot of, of stuff. Um, I really like enchiladas. Those are one of my, and all kinds of enchiladas. So like the traditional Mexican or kind of the, you know, the, the Americanized like flour tortilla ones. And then I also love all sorts of tacos, specifically like stewed meat tacos, barbacoa um, or carne asada or, you know, birria. I love a lot of Mexican food is kind of, those are kind of my favorites. Let me fish one of these out. Let's see what I can feel them getting crispy, but they're not quite there. Oh yeah, I think we're good actually. And these are blonder too. Um, so that the, uh, I should have mentioned the boiling process of these fries also gets rid of some of those uh, sugars on the exterior. So if you don't wash or boil or do something like that, the fries can get really, really burnt, um, brown and you'll think they're crisp. Like you'll be looking at them like, oh yeah, these are really crisp. And then you taste them and they're not crisp. They're actually just like burnt sugars on the outside. So that's kind of another benefit um, to, to that boiling method is being able to get, you know, like blonde looking fries that are still nice and crispy. And then, so I'm going to drain these. Let me turn off the oil here and then we'll uh, take a couple bites and then uh, we'll get out of here. It's been about an hour. So hopefully you guys have been enjoying. I always love making fried food. So for me, this was a, uh, this was a treat. And then what I do with this, I just let it completely cool down and then, um, and then I'll strain that afterwards. And if there, again, if there were like big things like the, uh, the oil or the uh, batter from earlier, I would fish that out and I wouldn't let that stuff cool down in there. And I should have hit, this is, this is what I'm saying, what happens with lives. I always forget to hit things with salt sometimes. So I forgot to do this afterwards, it's fine though. So we'll get the fries at least. Um, again, these things have been salted internally, so it's not like we completely missed out. It's not like they're going to be tasteless, but it is nice to have some, a uh, little bit of salt on the exterior. All right. And then we will plate some of these up. It's hot. Mm. There we go. Fish and chips, crispy, golden brown, 350 for the oil, shooting for like at least 140 in the center. If you do that, they should both be done at the same time. I feel like we got to do a close in uh, split up of this though. All right. This is still pretty warm coming in, coming in. Hopefully, hopefully this auto focuses not on me. Yes. That is all I'm after right there, ladies and gents. 
Hopefully you heard that through my lav mic. But uh, we're, we're right and crispy. And then I've got to give you guys a taste test. Big bites only. A little hot on the inside still, so. mm. but I mean, it's crunchy, it's flaky. I mean, that's just some high quality fish and chips. You know, with the tartar sauce too, mayonnaise, it's like, you know, you could also spritz some lemon over this. I used up all my lemon slices. But you guys know how I go in. But yeah, everybody, hopefully you guys enjoyed the class. Hopefully, um, you know, you learned a little bit about frying. I know we talked about reusing oil and all that stuff. So I'll let... Uh, uh, Thermo works, take it away. And, uh, yeah, we can get all out of here. Thanks everybody. Huge. Thanks to Ethan for that. That was, uh, amazing. The, the crunch of that fish as he was biting into it made me want to be in that room. So many, many thanks. Be sure to, to follow Ethan and subscribe to Ethan Schlebowski's channel on YouTube. You can check out the Thermopen one, of course, at thermoworks.com. And uh, thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next week when we'll have Machik of Grilling with Dad. He's going to be doing some pub.